E-K-N-O-W. All right, it says live. It says it's live. We had a problem last week, so let me see what Sergio says here before we uh, start into the thing. I watched you last week. It, well, the first four minutes, there was no sound. But I want to know from Sergio if... Uh, that was my favorite part. The what? Yeah. <laughs> That's your favorite part. Okay, we got sound and we got video. So, okay, we just wanted to start a minute early this week so we can make sure that we didn't have the same problem. Let me tell Sergio that all is good here. And let's see here. Two and two. Okay, we'll get started. Let's see. And we only got a couple people here. Uh, Pat and Cindy won't be coming. Jim and Linda won't be coming. If mom comes, she'll be late. And uh, so I think that's probably it. But we got Steve in here from out of town, which makes it really nice. Um, instead of reading the 118th Psalm today, you mean 19th. 119th Psalm, one of the octaves from that, what I'm going to do is Sergio sat down, he was reading the 119th Psalm, and he made a list from the 119th Psalm, instructions on what to do with the Bible from Psalm 119. Here are some of the things he penned down. Verse 7, learn the Bible. Verse 9, do what it says. Verse 11, memorize it. Verse 13, recite it out loud, which we do every week before we start. Verse 15, think about it. Verse 16, delight in it. Verse 18, pray for understanding it. Verse 42, trust in it. Verse 46, preach it. Verse 54, sing it. Verse six, you wouldn't want me to do that. It just wouldn't be good. Uh, let's see here. Verse 66, believe in it. Verse 81, be patient in it. Verse 95, diligently consider it. Verse 97, love it. Verse 99, gain wisdom from it. Verse 103, taste it. Verse 105, use it as a guide. Verse 111, regard it. Verse 130, deep study it. Verse 148, think about it at night. Verse 161, rejoice in it. Verse 165, have great peace in it. And verse 171, praise God for it. So let's do that. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your wonderful and precious word. We thank you for uh, the fact that we can open it, we can think on it, we can regard it, we can study it, we can sing it, we can apply it to our lives and have it direct our feet and be a guide for our path. Oh Lord, it is such a precious word. We thank you for it. And Lord, we're going to mention a couple of people that need prayers. And so we ask that you'll respond to that accordingly after we mention them. And we certainly pray for those that are traveling tonight or that aren't here for whatever reason that you'll take care of them. And Lord, we just love you. We thank you for the chance to get into this precious word. We thank you for it. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, here's what we got. A um, couple of things here. I'm going to put that under Psalm 119 so that I can refer to it from time to time, because that was good stuff. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, we have a praise. Instead of a request for prayer, Amanda wants to praise her husband's transmission seized up on the highway, and instead of having an accident, he got off the road, and it's going to be something very minor instead of something very major. So she's looking at the positive side of a difficult time. And uh, so praise there. And then we also have a couple of prayer requests uh, I, I, it's been really busy this week, so I haven't written all of them down, but uh, I got uh, Mary down in Naples and Becky out in Colorado and then Lothar. I heard from him today and each one of them has their own specific prayer needs that uh, they've asked for prayer and guidance on. And so we've already prayed about that, but we'll try to remember them again at the end of the uh, class. And then one more thing before we actually get started is last week, apparently somebody, actually a couple people emailed me and said that they didn't have sound on the uh, on the um, study last week. And I went to it and I just clicked in the middle of the video and said, I got sound here, but it was the first four minutes were silent. And so the study did work. Sergio got it fixed, but apparently there was a problem with the first four minutes. So there's no sound and whatever we said is lost to uh, time. But uh, there you go with that. And then seeing how we got started a couple minutes early, we might as well read uh, This Week in Christian History, which today is the 16th, 7th, 15th, 15th of August. We'll read that. And I couldn't read the one on Sunday. I started to read it and I started to cry. I had to stop. Just oh, rock of ages. Oh, okay, here we go. August 15th. 
No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Well, that's uh, John 6, 44, I believe. And uh, that is used by the Calvinists to say we don't have free will. And then it's completely refuted by John 12, where he says, And I, when I am lifted up, will draw all men unto me. So everything in context, John 6, 6 44, has to be taken in the context of the uh, chapter 5, where he's speaking about the word. And the Jews are the ones that administrated the word. They kept it, they preserved it, and there he stood in front of them, okay? When the word came through them, he was making a point about that. But Calvinists take that completely out of context, and yes, we do have free will. It's a very poor verse to use to claim that we don't have free will, but we'll go on. Uh, <coughs> Guido, or Guido Scalisi grew up in a hamlet of Mesorica, Italy. Nearby on a beautiful hill was a monastery on the Franciscan Friars of the Franciscan Friars, where he went to Mass weekly with his family. One balmy sun spring day, Guido particularly moved by the beautiful strains of the organ. He thought how inspiring it would be to spend his life in a monastery in close communion with God and nature. He announced to his mother, Mama, how wonderful it would be if I could become a priest. Words to thrill the heart of any Italian mother. Guido, or God, I don't know how you pronounce that. Anyway, he attended seminary from 1928 to 1932, and there were four difficult years. The seminary had no heat, no running water, and the winter was ice was broken into pieces and used as soap. He had no friends and no one in whom he could confide. Confide, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm really struggling here. Yet he preserved, persevered towards his goal. In 1940, Guido was ordained as a priest. He became a part of a monastery in Reggio de Calbria there on August 15, 1945. As he was <clears throat> passing by the local Baptist church, he suddenly had an unexplained desire to meet its pastor. As they talked, the pastor encouraged Guido to read the Bible. Now, this is a guy that's gone through seminary, then he hasn't read the Bible. Wow. Guido returned to the monastery and began to read the Bible in Italian. He was amazed by its contents. Every page brought new surprises. He kept asking himself how it was possible that he had lived so many years without ever knowing all the marvelous things he was learning from its pages. Not long after this encounter, Guido was transferred to a monastery at Stiletti, Italy. One day, a local peasant farmer stopped him and said that he had heard of his meeting with the Baptist pastor in Reggio de Calbria and said that his own pastor would like to meet him. Several nights later, he went to the pastor's home. The pastor was himself a simple peasant and did not make a very good first impression on the well-educated Guido. The pastor said to him, by now you know everything there is to know about the word of God. What you need now is salvation. Jesus wants to save you. He died on the cross to save your soul. As the pastor told the story of Jesus and Nicodemus from John 3, <clears throat> Guido listened intently and thought to himself, born again, if only I could be born again. As their discussion ended, the pastor asked if he could pray. He knelt, raised his hands toward heaven, and closed his eyes. Guido kept his eyes open. The pastor prayed that God would purify Guido's heart from sin and wash him in the blood of Jesus, who had died to pay the price to redeem him. Guido had never heard anyone pray like this before. The pastor was imploring God with his whole being. Guido finally closed his eyes, and suddenly all of his sins passed before him. In anguish, he wondered how he could free himself from this oppression. Then words from the pastor's prayer flashed through his mind. The blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. It was then that Guido abandoned himself to Jesus, crying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Save my soul. Peace flooded into his heart, and for the first time in his life, he felt the presence of Christ. It was so real that Guido felt that he had stretched out his hand. He would have touched the hem of Christ's garment. With eyes filled with tears, he embraced the pastor and told him, Brother, I have decided to serve the Lord for life or death. Guido Scalzi left the monastery and served the Lord as director of La Voice, La Voce della Speranza, the Voice of Hope, a radio broadcast carried on stations in the United States and throughout Europe. And like Guido Scalzi, many people are very religious, trusting their church involvement to get them to heaven. Does that describe you? It wasn't until he personally trusted in Christ to cleanse him from his sin that he found peace and salvation. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved.
So there you go. Guys in a Catholic monastery after four, seminary, four years, I guess it said, and he doesn't know who Jesus is. Unbelievable. There you go. I'm glad he met him. Glad he got out of the monastery. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 26 today. <sighs> You know what it is? Once I started talking, all that candy we've been eating caught up with me. Oh, you got we got a frog in your pocket. Yeah, I, I got a frog in my pocket and one in my throat. I'll tell you that. <clears throat> wow. Let's see here. We got uh, yes, twelve twenty-six, and with no gem here, I'll go ahead and just read, and we will go back to verse uh, twenty-three just to get a idea of what what we're doing here. Twenty-three, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our presentable parts have greater modesty, <clears throat> but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given a greater honor to that part which lacks it. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. In verse 26, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Okay, we've been talking about the body. Remember that for the past, you know, several verses. In this verse, 26, Paul completes his thoughts concerning the natural body and how each part interacts with other parts. His words are a universally understood maxim. He says that if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If a person is walking along in great shape and he suddenly stubs his toe on a rock, ouch! The entire body will feel the pain. The entire body will be stopped in its motion, and the entire body will work in a harmonious fashion to affect healing. I know this because I was plugging in this chair about 30 minutes ago while Burke was vacuuming, and I caught myself really hard right on the corner of this shelf right here. And the first thing Burke said is, I hope the camera's okay. I've got blood pouring down my face. Look at the pool of it over here. <laughs> And so I emailed Sergio, I took a picture of him, and I said, if you're here and you have to plug in this chair, don't forget that there's a, a shelf up there. First thing Sergio says is, how's the camera? <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, so anyway, uh, blood will be pumped, brain chemicals will be released, tears may be shed, lungs fill with healing oxygen, and so on. All the bodies working together to fix poor Charlie's brain. The left arm doesn't continue on the journey, leaving the rest of the body behind. The fingernails don't leave the body and decide to head home. Rather, every part stays and each part accomplishes what is necessary to make things right. If the accident was a thorn instead of a rock, the fingernails will participate in removing the thorn. The left hand may hold the foot while the right hand does the pulling. Everything is joined in the effort of one hurting big toe. Plato understood this when he wrote the words, as in the body, when but a finger is hurt, the whole frame drawn towards the soul and forming one realm under the ruling power therein feels the hurt and sympathizes all together with the part affected. That's from the Republic. In the same way, when honor is bestowed upon a part of the body, something different occurs. Paul says that if one, that if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. If the back is treated to a massage, ooh and ah, the rest of the body shares in the sensation. The mind relaxes, the lungs quiet down to a slow pace, the arms stop worrying about the loads they normally carry, the eyes get heavy and they close in delight. It is a harmonious interaction of enormous satisfaction. Life application. When someone in your church is negatively affected by life's trials, do you share in their miseries? When someone in your church is honored for their efforts along life's path, do you glory with them and their glory as well? This is what should occur. If we truly are a united body, then we should truly be united in that regard. That is what Paul would tell us. Verse 27. Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually. So he's got done talking about all these different body parts. And uh, I'll tell you, when I was... Uh, what was it? Uh, wastewater treatment about 15 years ago, I suppose it was. And I used to take care of the grit chamber. I was telling this to somebody just a couple days ago. And I had stubbed my toe and torn off the toenail. And the grit chamber is where the water comes in at a high speed. 
then it it goes through a bar screen which catches any rags and any money and anything that gets you know comes into the not shouldn't be in the plant okay and it catches all that big stuff and then after the bar screen it goes through a big area which is very slow moving and the water settles down and all the grit and sand and everything settles out of there and that keeps the pumps from wearing out it keeps the uh uh, tanks from getting clogged up with all kinds of grit and everything so we get that out and the way there are different ways of doing it you can use a centrifuge but the centrifuges wear very quickly because it's very abrasive and you got to replace parts it's expensive so what we would have in the plant that I ran we just had a big bathtub with a cork in it we would pull the cork the water would drain out and then you'd get in and you'd shovel all of the grit from the week into the dumpster and the uh, garbage man would come and take it away okay and I went in there one time, and my boots got a a uh, hole in them. And we have mud boots, and I got a hole in them, and I had my toe torn off, and it got infected. I didn't know that that water had gotten in there. And I got home, and I it was so bad I had septicemia running up my legs, the red lines. And by the time I got to the hospital, the doctor says, you could have died. It could have gone to your heart and killed you. But in the meantime, my toe hurt so badly, I told Hidako, get a knife i'm just going to cut it off i can't take the pain she's like now we'll get you to the doctor and but it was so bad the whole body feels this now this is what the point he's trying to make is that we are one body and we should feel the pain that others feel we shouldn't reject them we shouldn't cut them off and if we have a disagreement with somebody in the church we should try our best to heal that you know i mean the word i'm sorry or i hope we can make things up is hard it's one of the hardest things that we as humans have but it's something that we should do and when somebody is sad, you know, and we know that they're despondent, we'd maybe go visit them at their house. And if somebody's in the hospital, we should try. And this church is very good about when I go to the hospital, there's usually somebody from the church visiting somebody that is in the hospital from the church. So uh, this is what we should be doing. And we don't always do it. And uh, in the end, the ones that will suffer for not taking those type of actions are the ones that should have taken them, not the person that's actually in the suffering point. They can just go find another church where they'll be fed or well they'll they'll be more accepted and it'll be the church's loss but in the end we're all one body all of the people in all churches and so we should be in this and i know it's not easy i understand that there are people that just wear you out and they'll wear you down but the point is made that my toe hurt and the whole body was affected that's the point i'm making all right so um 27 Let's see here. Now, oh, I read that. I'll read it again. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. After having discussed the natural body and how each part functions in connection with the other parts, Paul now equates the church with the body. What was true with the natural body is certainly true with the spiritual body. There's an overall body which is comprised of individual members. And he says, now you are the body of Christ. This isn't meant that the church in Corinth comprises the whole body. Rather, as a church, they are the body, just as the church in Ephesus is the body. And the superior word in ever sunny Sarasota, Florida, is the body. And that's kind of a lie, isn't it? Because this has been the rainiest, grayest week I remember in all of my life. I've seen rainier weeks where we've had a lot of rain, but the sun has come out. I haven't seen the sun in, what, three days? Maybe four? But it's cooler. It's cooler. I'm telling you, it's been very nice. But I, I cannot remember a week that has been this gray in all of my life, but I'll still leave the ever sunny there just in case uh, uh, it, the sun clears up tomorrow. We'll, we'll say we just had a little break from it. The uh, church universal, which is comprised of the church individual, is what forms the body. In each church, there are individual members, which then comprise members individually. And of course, above all of these individual members is Christ, the head of the church. This is the way the organization works. For far too long, individual denominations have claimed that they are the body and anyone outside of their denomination is not a part of the true church. You get that all the time. Church of Christ. You haven't been baptized in the Church of Christ. You're not a Christian. Jehovah's Witnesses, which aren't a part of the church, but they make that claim. We are the church. If you're not with us, King James only people do it all the time. You can't be saved unless you... Read the King James Version. I heard that in that church a million times. These people reading a false version of the Bible. It's to divide. Divide, divide, divide over things that are absolutely crazy. Anyway, um, 
Uh, I won't get into King James onlyism today, but wow, nonsense. My next word, nonsense. The church is comprised of faithful believers in Christ. 99% of all of the world never had a King James Bible, and yet they're saved believers from AD 1 all the way up, or AD 33, all the way up until the present day, right? There was never a Jehovah's, I shouldn't even use them as an example. I use them as an example of an apostate church, but Church of Christ, or all of these people that say, we're the true church and nobody else is, they're dividing and it's nonsense. If you hear that, that exclusivity, it's probably a time to leave that particular church. The church is comprised of faithful believers in Christ. Never let the individual parts dictate the truth about the whole. This is exactly what Paul has argued against for so many verses. And life application here, if you are in a church body, here it is, that claims it is the only true church body, then you should probably find another place to worship. Christ Jesus is the unifying factor within the church, not man-made edict and suppositions. Edicts and suppositions. The uh, Catholic Church, Mel Gibson believes they're the only church. He heard it when he was, at some point in his life, he said, it's true, if you uh, aren't a part of the uh, Catholic Church, you can't be saved. It's He's the one true church. It's the one true church, and they believe that. People get duped into believing that kind of nonsense. And here we've got, right in our Christian history today, a guy that was a member of the church that didn't even know who Christ was, and he's a supposed priest of the people. Absolutely crazy. So, you know, if you're in that kind of a church where people say that kind of stuff, you need to leave that church. Anyway, 1228. After having described the properties of individual members, Paul now turns to the gifts possessed by those members. I didn't read the verse. Let me read it first. Verse 28. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. All right, let me start again with my comments. After having described the properties of individual members, Paul now turns to the gifts possessed by those members. He gives similar lists elsewhere, but they may differ a little bit, and they may be in a slightly different order as well. However, for this list, he notes that God has appointed these in the church. The intent of this wording is to show that certain individuals have been granted certain gifts for the sake of the body. Burke will have something that Steve doesn't have, and Steve will have something that I don't have, or maybe two of us share a gift that nobody else in the church has, whatever, okay? God has appointed. He begins the list by stating first apostles. These are sent ones who were commissioned directly by the Lord for the purpose of his of witnessing his work. Now, what that means is, and I've said this before, and it's good to repeat it from time to time, is that there are no apostles of Jesus today. There have not been since the last person that was appointed as an apostle died. The last person that was appointed an apostle was Paul. He was appointed later. It's not the last one that died. I believe it was John, right? But Paul was the last appointed apostle of the Lord because he was the last one directly commissioned by the Lord. If somebody claims the title of apostle today, they are misusing that particular title. You can be an apostle like you could be apostle of the superior word church. You're a sent one. The church is sending you to Uganda or he's sending you to Kenya. Okay. But why use the term? Why even use it? It's just a title that doesn't, it's showy and it doesn't serve any purpose. The less titles we have, the better off we're going to be, in my opinion. Anyway, let's see here. They've been granted the highest position the apostles have within the church, and their era lasted until the completion of the Bible. The apostolic period of the church ended with the death of the last apostle. However, the writings of the apostolic period actually ends with the words, with the word amen penned by John at the end of the book of Revelation. That is when the apostolic age actually ended. It ended in reality with John's death, but his completion of Revelation was the end of the apostolic age as far as revelation that would be transmitted to the people of the church. There are now no apostles, despite some claiming the term. Paul shows that after apostles come prophets. The office of prophet holds two significations. The first is foretelling. This is an utterance from the Lord about something future. It is a proclamation of something previously unknown. Although there may have been people with this gift at the time of the letter to Corinth, 
There's no need for this type of office now. Anybody tell me why? Completed. The Bible's completed. It tells us all we need to know about redemptive history until the Lord comes. There's no need for a prophet in today's church. If somebody claims prophecy in today's church, they are false. That's all there is to it. There's no need for that type of thing. We have the word. The word is written. It is documented. And this is what we need to have for our faith and practice. Anything added to that is superfluous. And there is not, after 2,000 years of people claiming prophecies, I want you to know that there is not one of those supposed prophecies that have added anything to the word of God. Not one. Think of it. How many of them have any value in the world today? None. So have right doctrine on that particular issue. Therefore, people who claim this as a gift do so from a very tenuous position, claiming extra biblical revelation. The second type of prophet is forthtelling. It is the interpretation and explanation of what has been recorded in the Bible. It is the job of faithful men of God who preach from the pulpit or on the streets or wherever else to the people. Where the word is proclaimed, the forthtelling of the word is being accomplished. After prophets come teachers. This is similar to forthtelling prophet, a preacher, but it may involve less formal oration. It is similar to any type of classroom study. Questions may be asked and answers may be provided. The text, the teaching gift is instrumental in the discipleship of others. If you want to be obedient to the word of the Lord in Matthew 28, where it says, go there and make disciples, that's what you would do. You would teach people. You wouldn't just get them converted because conversion is one part of an ongoing, ongoing process. And you should, after that, be teaching people. You should be discipling them. That would fall under the gift of teaching. Okay. Paul then says, after that, miracles are next. A miracle is above and beyond what would normally be expected from a person, exceeding general capabilities. It is an active display of the power of God for the building up of the church. However, there are those who have unusual abilities and who will claim their gift is from the Spirit. People can do an astonishing array of unique things, but this doesn't mean that their ability is a true spiritual ability or gift. It can only be considered as such if its intent is to what? Somebody has a gift of miracles. How do you know if it's true or not? Or you might not even know with this, but it must do this in order to be true. It must bring glory to God. If it doesn't bring glory to God, then it is not a valid gift or use of that gift in any way, shape, or form. Next are gifts of healings. These would be truly miraculous healings which come by faith through prayer. There's no reason to not believe in this gift today, but there is every reason to question it as it is presented. Charlatans fill the halls of Christianity claiming this gift when they don't possess it. The best policy is to believe in faith healing, but not in faith healers. I'm going to give her a pass today because she did email and say she'd be late. So I'm going to give her a pass. There are those who truly have faith that their prayers will be answered. And God truly hears their prayers and responds through effectual healing of the sick. That is the gift of healing. Okay. People praying for others. People having the gift of healing through petitioning God. Because ultimately all healing must come from Christ. If it is a true healing of God. Okay. From there. Paul notes helps. The Greek word is found only here in the New Testament. It is speaking of various types of aid, help, or assistance. Some may give money to help others. Some may donate their particular skills, such as being an electrician, to help out. Some may have an abundance of time to help with various needs. Whatever the help is needed, the need is met through this type of gift. And that's something that almost everybody can have at one time or another. You can be a help to somebody. All right. Next is administrations. This is what I did in the U.S. Air Force for nine years, four months, and 15 days. But it wasn't a gift of the Spirit. It was just what counting. I did. What's that? Not that you're counting. Not that I'm counting by any stretch of the imagination. What did I say? Nine years, four months, and 15 days. Uh -huh. Three hours and 27 minutes. <sighs> Again, this gift, this Greek word is found only here in the New Testament. It is derived from the word steer. Think of administrations and you're steering. People have this... A uh, gift, they have the ability to steer the church just as a shipmaster can steer the ship. 
They are able to make sound choices concerning what should be done, when it should be done, and what direction should be taken for the benefit of the overall body. That would be the gift of administrations. And there are people like that. And I think I talked about it a week or two ago where people will often have a gift, something like this, and they actually help the church out more than almost anybody else, and you never know it. They just are quiet back there. They never ask for any recognition. The pastor will go to them and he'll say, we need this done, and how do I do it? And there he is, he's got the answer. That's a guy with administrations, all right? I assure you that I do not have that gift in any way, shape, or form. We've got the Superior Word Church here, and we've got all kinds of things that work very well together, and yet I did not put any of them together. The administrator of this church, and I, I don't mean to be boastful about the church, it's just the truth, is Christ. Because when we needed to get these videos, somebody showed up that knew how to make videos, and he started editing them and processing them. And then we needed a website, and somebody just simply said, I want to do a website for you. And he's been doing it now for nine years, I believe. Nine years he's been doing faithfully. Every single day he takes care of the website. Won't give me his real name. All I have is his first name. And he's been doing it now for nine years. He checks everything I type. Unbelievable. I didn't ask for it. The Lord just sent it here. We need to have a nice presentation of the videos. And somebody over in Ireland says, listen, I want to do, uh, uh, actually, I don't know how. I, I might have asked him or he might have volunteered or somehow we were talking on Facebook and he decided he's going to do a painting for the sermon every single week. And he's never missed one despite terrible headaches or vertigo or some other physical problems. He has. He's done one every week. So the Lord has done these and other things. People, the, uh, we needed to start the podcast. People wanted podcasts and come to find out there's somebody that had done a podcast on every sermon I've ever done. He had it in his uh, uh, file and he just sent it to us. Then now Mike, the guy that does the website, just does them, the new ones every time and adds them in. But this is the Lord's doing. It had nothing to do with Charlie administering anything because I couldn't administrate my way out of a rabbit hole. And, and that's the truth. But there you go, administrations. Lastly, Paul notes that variety of tongues are available as gifts. Tongues are, and I said this three weeks ago, I'll say it again. Yes, known languages, not made up gurgling. Some possess the ability to speak other languages, which may be needed as visitors come or as missionaries are sent. It is considered the least of the gifts because it is a gift which can be acquired by most through study or immersion. Almost anybody can learn another language. It is also an ability that many have that aren't in the church. I mean, there's people all over the world that have the gift of languages or tongues, okay? Just because somebody speaks a tongue doesn't mean it's a gift of the Lord. When it is used to glorify God in the church, it is a gift, and it is used in that way, okay? If all the members of the church speak the same language, there's no need for tongues to be spoken, except perhaps to teach others the biblical languages or to teach others a language needed for mission work or the like. Everybody got that? If there, everybody in this church speaks English, there's no need at all in any way, shape, or form for people to speak in tongues. And yet, go to churches in America where there's only English-speaking people, and they're rolling around on the floor and speaking in supposed tongues. That is totally contrary to the point of tongues in the first place, and it shows you that it's false. Secondly, it's false because they don't have an interpreter. Then third, it's false because more than three are speaking in tongues when that's the limit given by Paul which was under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So you know it's false. You don't need to go any further with that kind of stuff. Okay, I've had people say, well, my prayer language is, and I don't know what I'm speaking, but that's my prayer language. Well, then it's not a valid tongue because if you don't know what you're saying and you're supposedly speaking it, you're not edifying not only anybody else, but not yourself too. So it's false. It is false. Okay, we'll get into that more, but I'll say it now, and I'm sure I'll say it during the tongues part of the, the thing, but... Guess what other cultures have in their own religions? The same thing the charismatics have in their churches. How do I know? Because I lived next to a Shoku Gokai Buddhist in Japan, and she supposedly spoke in ecstatic tongues, exactly the way charismatics do. They do it in Hinduism. They do it in all kinds of other religions around the world. Well, is that from God or is that from the devil? Okay. Let's see here. It should be noted that there is often an overlap in the gifts individuals possess. Paul was an apostle, but he also was shown to have possessed other gifts listed here. An example is healings. At times, Paul healed others as is recorded in the book of Acts. 
However, there are times when Paul could not heal others. I went through those a week or two ago. So obviously, healings isn't a Benny Hinn type of thing. What you see there is obviously false. Therefore, it is obvious that this gift is something given by God for specific occasions and not for all times. In other words, faith healers are claiming an ongoing gift where the Bible shows that it is not an ongoing gift. In the end, all gifts that are truly gifts are given by God for his purposes. Whatever our gift is, we should be thankful to the Lord for it and use it for his glory. If you're using a gift that you have and you're not using it for his glory, then you're wasting it. Or you're using it for your own life, and that's fine. You can use your gift at work or helping out your neighbor. But if you're not doing it to glorify the God, to glorify God, then you are wasting your gift in the church. Okay? Life application. <clears throat> There's no true believer in Christ who does not possess an ability which can be described as a gift. We can and should use our gift to the utmost of our ability for the purpose of bringing glory to God. I got to just stop for one second. I apologize, but I just can't take this anymore. I'm choking on myself. Mm. And the worst part of this mm, is I got the frozen one out, and so it's almost all ice. So that's all right. I got a little bit. Hopefully, I won't choke myself anymore today. Okay, 1229. Are all Oh, I've got to stop here. I just noticed I got this shirt on. It just came. Mary down in uh, Naples went to Ho uh, Alaska, and she sent me a... It says, hey, look, a menu. And it's got two bears looking at a car with the little family figures on the back. Yeah, little children, mom and dad and all that. Look, a menu. That's, I thought that was very cute. Okay, here we go. Uh, 1229. Um, let's see here. Thank you, Mary. Are all apostles... Are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Paul will close out this chapter with obvious questions concerning the structure and makeup of the body, and then redirect those questions with a final thought before moving into chapter 13. These four questions follow directly in line, ooh, thank you, follow directly in line with the appointments he noted in the previous verse, which said, and God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles. In the Greek, each of these first four was an individual appointment, which was followed by an adverb, which demonstrated a sort of hierarchical structure. The obvious answer to each question was no. If all were apostles, then where would the prophet, teacher, or worker of miracles be? If all were prophets, then where would be the apostles for establishing church doctrine in accord with Christ's commands? Where would be the teachers to train up disciples? And where would be those who validated the word through miracles? The same is true with each appointment. All are necessary, but none is sufficient to handle all of the needs and issues within the church. Life application. What is your appointment within the church? You certainly have one, and you should be carrying it out to the very best of your ability. Is everybody thinking while I'm reading this? Because you should be. What can you do within the church that is to the best of your ability. And for some people, it may be just warming a pew. That's all that they are up to at this point in their life. And I'm not belittling people when I say that. Some people just need to take a break. And they need to warm up you, okay? But at least they're there with the church. They're fellowshipping. They're enjoying with other people, okay? But everybody should be evaluating themselves while I'm reading this, not just listening, saying, oh gosh, another thing about gifts, okay? We really should be. Um, you certainly have one. You should be carrying it out to the very best of your ability. If it seems like a lesser appointment than what another possesses, remember that they cannot do without you. Be satisfied that the Lord has you exactly where he wants you for his good purposes. There are other gifts that Paul will mention elsewhere. I thought that I was going to list them, and maybe I do, but, you know, helps administrations, giving. There, everything that you can do for a church or the church will help out, that is a gift. And some people can do any or all of those, okay? At one time or another, there's something that you can do of the ones that I just said, helping, uh, administration, giving, um, uh, tongues, not everybody's going to do, but everybody could do it. We can all learn a language. But anyway, there are some that we just can't do anymore, <coughs> like being an apostle, but there are some that everybody can do. Okay, 1230. Uh, well, What's that? 1025 of Hebrews. 
Ten twenty-five of Hebrews. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Yep. As is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. That's a gift the, right there. All the more as you see the day approaching. Yep. Just your presence there. Your presence there, encouraging other people. And there are some people, and I've said this, I'm so thankful we have online ministries because there are some people that have no church in the local town. And that this is their local church. There are people in England, they say, we have zero church within our range. We have no other place to go. And so the superior word is where we attend. And what do they do? They encourage me through emails. And I got to tell you what, they'll say, wow, Sunday sermon was, and they'll say something and whatever. That right there is enough to get me wanting to type Monday's sermon. Okay. So you're right. Now they, they cannot actually be with people, but they are there with them online and they are there and maybe they're encouraging through the, you know, the talking on the side of the chat. I don't know. I don't ever see that kind of stuff. And so I, I don't know. But apparently on YouTube, they're just talking all the way through the sermon and doing whatever they're doing. But, um, yeah, I, when somebody sends me an email on Monday and, you know, I know it's somebody that this is their church, Lisa out in Australia, for example, and she'll send something and, you know, something about the church. It always blesses me. So there you go. Um, we'll go on. Let's see here. 1230. Uh, but, yeah, encouraging. 12.30, do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Here Paul finishes his lift, list of gifts that have been dispersed among the body. In this he lists two of the gifts that were lumped together without an adverb, separating them during his previous list. They are healings and tongues. He also leaves out helps and administrations, which were in the same combined list and he adds in the gift of interpreting. So he's kind of changing things around. All right. So it shows you that these aren't fixed and set things of gifts either. By him doing this and then adding one in here and dropping this out, he's saying that gifts isn't just limited to what I'm saying. It's just a list that I'm giving you to think through. Okay. Going on. These three should all be considered lesser gifts because of how they were kept separate from the previously noted gifts. Further. Paul will especially speak about tongues and their interpretation as he continues later in chapter 14. We're going to go into complete detail on the subject of tongues in, it'll be just another couple of weeks, all right? Chapter 13 is very short. We're at the end of chapter 12. We'll get into the gifts of tongues, and we'll go through it in detail. And if you speak another language, which I know a couple people in here do, then you will be able to think about the, the, what Paul is saying. Is that outside? Yeah, that's outside. Okay. Um, okay, anyway, um, there we will see that even at the time of the early church, the gift of tongues was not being handled in an appropriate manner by the Christians. Because of this, he will give explicit instruction concerning this gift, instructions which have been completely ignored by most charismatic churches since the beginning of the charismatic movement. Likewise, the abuse of the gift of healings has reached such an absurd level that churches often seem more like a comedy show than a true church in any real sense. In the abuse of these two gifts, there has been a complete lack of holiness, order, and honor for the exalted name of Jesus. And that's what it all comes back to. I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's for the glory of God or it is of no value at all, okay? If someone truly possesses the gift of healing, they will use it in a manner which highlights the Lord not the possessor of the supposed gift. And if someone has the ability to speak in another language, they are to follow the explicit instructions for tongues given in chapter 14. If these aren't followed, then what is presented is not a gift, but rather an ostentatious show designed to call attention to oneself and not to the Lord. Life application. Paul's words are doctrine for the church. They were given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and therefore, any conduct in a church which contradicts or ignores his instructions cannot, cannot be of God. Yeah, I know that I bring up tongues all the time because it's such an obvious thing and it's such an abuse thing. And because when I went to apply for a seminary, when I wanted to become ordained and start doing whatever an ordained person would do, I checked out all of the colleges in Florida and I had about seven of them that I checked out and they said, Oh, you have to speak in tongues in order to prove you have the gift of the Spirit before we'll accept you. Mm. And I thought, huh, huh. And ever since then, I've been on just this thing against tongues. It's such, it's such a misused precept. It is such a, a, 
Ah, we'll just stop there before I get angry again. Um, Twelve thirty-one. I'll get angry enough in chapter 14, I'm sure. Anyway, but I earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. This is the end of chapter 12. Paul closes this chapter with a verse that looks back on what he has said and forward to what he will say. Chapter 12 is spoken of gifts of the Spirit, their distribution, their use, their interdependence on one another, and their state and position within the body. Here he shows that there is nothing wrong and everything right with earnestly desiring the better gifts. As we grow in Christ and mature in our theology, it is right to strive for better gifts in order to benefit the church as a whole. However, there are points that should be considered as we strive for the greater gifts. One, we were accepted by Christ and may have possessed a lesser gift when we were accepted by him. Or we might not have had any gift that we know, knew of. We're just, I can't do anything. It just, but you were accepted by Christ. You believed, you were sealed, job done. All right, that tells you that the gift is something that is not necessary for salvation. Unlike those seminaries that said, I need to prove that I'm saved by speaking tongues. They've added to the word of God. They've added to the gospel of God. It cannot be the gospel if that is what they say. Okay, two, the gift we possessed and the gifts we strive for are still gifts. They are available to us from an external source. Even if we spend our time perfecting a gift, teaching for example, it is God who gave us the time and the desire to do so. In the end, the gift must be credited to God. Three, our greater gifts or gift still require the gifts and the presence of all other members in the church. Paul explained this in detail in the preceding verses. And four, if we possess a greater gift, it may actually receive less honor from the body than the one who is a possessor of a lesser gift. Again, Paul explained this before. For these and certainly a host of other reasons, it is inexcusable to argue over the gifts that we have been given, to lord them over others for any reason, or to feel that what we have is not as valuable as what others possess. The body is a single unit of many members, which should have one ultimate goal and aim. And because of this, Paul will enter into chapter 13 with one of the greatest discourses on the subject of love ever penned. The entire chapter will be devoted to this subject, and it will be based on the material he has presented in chapter 12 concerning gifts. You have to remember the context. He's giving this chapter on love based on what he has just said in chapter 12. To introduce this new thought, he simply states, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. The more excellent way is love. And I will say that this is one of the most asked for passages of any passage when I do a wedding. I've done a lot of weddings, lots and lots of them, and 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is almost always figured into that. Some, even by non-believers, they read it and they think, I want that in my, because I sent them like 10 or 12 different weddings I've done. And, you know, here's some ideas if you want to have a secular wedding or if you want to have a religious wedding and whatever. And I just send all of it and I say, pick and choose what you want, add in anything you want. And it almost always comes back with this passage. Almost always. Life application. You have a gift. It is appropriate to your station in life and in Christ. And it can and it does bring honor to the Lord as you use it to his glory. Okay, 13.1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. After a short note of something special coming in the preceding verse, Paul seems to suddenly interrupt the flow of the letter concerning controversial issues and begins a discourse on the necessity and power of love in order to overcome all obstacles. There's nothing out of place with this insertion but rather it is a necessary component which is given to remind his audience that there is an overarching point upon which all other matters of doctrine should be subjected. That this is a certain truth is confirmed by the words of the Lord himself when he said this to an inquisitive lawyer concerning matters of the law. Let me take you to Matthew chapter 22. And he says there in Matthew 22 verse 37, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. In verse 39, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Love is the central tenet of true worship, and it is the heart of true fellowship between God and man, and between man and man. Paul will describe what it means to be lacking this most important principle by beginning with, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. There are literally thousands of known languages in the world. These are the tongues of men. Understanding and speaking more than one or two of them is a rare and valuable commodity. Unless you're in Europe, then they can speak three, four, or five of them. But I'm talking about in general, most people speak one or two languages, and that's about it. In some cultures, knowing several languages is more common than others because of interaction between cultures, but there is always a limit to that interaction. The more languages a person knows, the more important they become as an asset to others as they speak words of trade, help, and even diplomacy. The tongues of angels is not speaking of some unknown language that is beyond the reach of human knowledge, which charismatics will say that. Nor is it speaking of unintelligible gurglings, which people claim is a divine spark of inspiration, which then proves that they have some special connection with the Holy Spirit. That is not what the tongues of angels is speaking about. Rather, Hebrews tells us that angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Therefore, the tongues of angels is tied to their interactions with humans. They speak with authority because they are messengers of God. That's the tongues of angels. They speak with care because they are ministering spirits for God's people. They speak with eloquence because they speak the words which are given them through, through them by the Creator. The tongues of angels are known languages which carry the power and authority of God. Paul notes that even if he speaks with these tongues, which are powerful in and of themselves for effecting various purposes, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. The utter futility of possessing the power of the tongue is evident in the lack of love in the use of that tongue. Paul equates it to a sounding brass. When a horn is blown, it makes a sound. It can even make a sound which is musical and pleasing to the ear. However, it is still an unintelligible sound. It is simply a tone of noise. To speak with love is such a tone. In modern terms, we would call such noise paying lip service or I'm sorry, to speak without love, would be paying lip service. If there is a spoken word to the Lord, but there is no love behind the word, there is no true devotion to the Lord. If a person says he cares about a matter, but he doesn't follow up with actions which complement the words, then there's no true substance behind the words. In essence, he's like breath on a cold morning, which simply fades out as he speaks. All right, read that again. If a person says he cares about a matter, because we see this on Facebook, for example, all the time. Somebody says, oh, you know, I'm having a bad day. I need some prayers. And people say, I'm praying for you. If they're just saying that and they're not following through with prayers, then all they are is just breath being expelled for no reason at all. Okay. What's that? They're lying. They're lying. That's exactly right. If I say, I will pray for you, the first thing I do after posting that is stop and pray for them. It may be the only time I pray for them, but I will do it right then. And if I remember, what I usually do is I pray for them and they say, Lord, I know that I'm going to forget this because I've got 10,000 other things to do. So when I say my prayers tonight, please add them into my prayers. So I prayed for them twice, even though I've only prayed for them once. Okay. And I do that every time because when I say I'm going to pray for somebody in one of those posts, it'll happen. Okay. But if you don't do that, you're just wasting breath and you're, as she said, lying. Paul also calls this type of speech a clanging symbol. Uh, symbol clangs by being struck to make sound resonate off of it. Without there being harmony between the one striking the symbol and the symbol being struck, the noise will be offensive, not melodious. If a child bangs on a symbol, it is annoying. However, if one who is mature will take Buddy Rich, anybody remember him? Oh, great drummer. Um, he's mature, he understands the structure of music and how to obtain the proper sound for the brass to make that music. It is both pleasing to the ears and, in, and effective in its purpose. 
either by itself or in unison with others playing other instruments. Buddy Rich, if you don't know who he was, was a great drummer. He's probably dead by now. I'm sure he is, but he went back to like the 40s or something, and he would, everybody wanted him. If you had a band, you would always say, we want to have him, and it was a status symbol. He was the great drummer of his age. Without love, there's only noise without purpose. Without love, there's only disharmony and an unsettling din of noise, like the kid banging on the cymbal. But with love, there is effective communication, edification, and peace between those who are communicating. Life application. As Christians, we would do well to pay close attention to the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and apply them to our lives. May God be pleased with hearts which are acting in love in agreement with the words spoken which profess that love. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move, remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And the first one there, although I have the gift of prophecy, it just I get this a lot because I have a prophecy update. And as I've said before, everybody is a specialist in the Bible. Everybody. They may have never read it more than once or even one full time, but they are a specialist. And they get into prophecy updates and they've got their mind made up about prophecy. And there is very rarely love when I get an email about <laughs> prophecy. Okay. There are people that are very gracious with this, but there are a lot of people that all they want to do is tell you that they know everything about prophecy and they're very unloving. And that's just the way it is. And so what Paul is saying here is exactly what that is. People can be so unloving about their knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, Paul says, but love edifies. Let's see here. In continuance of the previous thought concerning tongues, Paul now moves to the gift of prophecy. This was esteemed as a higher gift than tongues by him in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. He notes here that if he possesses this gift, which would allow him to understand all mysteries and all knowledge, there would still be a lack without love. The term mysteries refers to that which was once unknown but which has been revealed by God at the right time to continue to make known his plan of redemption. It is not specifically referring to predictions of things which will occur in the future, but to the revealing of anything that has or may occur and how that information fits into redemptive history. This idea is actually found all the way back in the books of Moses. Does anybody know what verse I'm going to go to? Burke wasn't here, so... He, he just walked back in. But anybody else know it? Secret things belonging to the Lord. Deuteronomy 33. 29 verse 29. Very good, Burke. That was outstanding. <laughs> it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. There, on the left of the page, right down at the bottom. There you go, left of the right down at the bottom. Yeah, it's, it, God keeps things secret until he reveals them. And once he reveals them, he has done it so that we have that information. Okay, that's why he does these things. The Bible is written. We're not going to get any more prophecy. There are things that are still secret. When I went to write down what the seven voices uttered, I was told to not write them down. It might be the word thundered, whatever. Anyway, I'm just misquoting a verse from Revelation. There are some things that John did see that he was not allowed to tell us, okay? So there are certain mysteries, but those are not going to be revealed to us in prophecy. They will be revealed to us in time, okay? The book is written. All right, so possessing such knowledge or being able to discern such knowledge from his word is not an end in and of itself. It is simply a gift like any other which needs to be accompanied by love. An example of this might be a very scholarly seminary professor. He understands the biblical languages and he has great insights into many patterns of scripture which point to God's revealed plans. You see that in seminaries all over the place. But if he doesn't truly love God or his word, all of his knowledge is ultimately futile. In the end, his temporary knowledge will be consumed by the march of time. Other people may benefit from it, but it didn't do him any good at all. Paul continues with the thought that though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. This isn't speaking of saving faith. 
but rather the faith that can do all things. This is evidenced by the word so that I could remove mountains. As an example, a person may have great confidence that he can start a church. He can build it to a very successful ministry, work through all of the bureaucracy of, of building a large sanctuary, organizing worship teams, pastoral teams, and so on, so that he has the biggest ministry in town. Such a person is self-confident of his abilities and can remove mountains. However, if he is doing it for self-aggrandizement or simply to get wealthy, all of his efforts are in vain. In the end, he will be no closer to true life than a pagan who worships in an idol's temple. It's got to be for God's glory or it's for no pur purpose or value at all. Life application. Great human achievement or possessing great wealth is not an indication of a great person. I've got somebody in my family that thinks if you're wealthy, you're very intelligent or you're, you know, you're obviously somebody that should be talked to or listened to or whatever. That's probably the least valuable thing that I could think of on this planet. It's, he's got a lot of money. Go ask him a question. Why would I ask him a question? That's nothing to do with just because somebody has been blessed by the Lord, whether he acknowledges it or not, with a lot of money doesn't mean he has a lick of sense in his head, right? Okay. There are a lot of rich people out there that don't have a lick of sense in their head. That's the point I'm trying to make. True greatness comes from a love for God, a love for the church of God's people, a heart for God's word, and a desire to glorify God in every respect and aspect of life. 13.3 we're just burning up the verses today. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now think of that. Think in a wedding and you're hearing these words spoken. And, you know, you love this person next to you, but you're not always going to be loving towards them, right? And this is what Paul is referring to just as much for us in the church as it is for people in a union together. They're really good words to have at a wedding because they really pin home what we should do as far as our responsibility towards our spouse. Because love in the Bible is not the emotional state of love for the most part. It is a volitional act of the will. I am really upset at my wife right now, but I'm going to love her anyway. Okay? I can tell you that my wife is very good about that. I may upset her deeply and I'll still have a good dinner that night. She's able to take the two and separate them. And good evening there, Mr. Garrett. So it, love is a volitional act of the will, okay? Anything other than that is an emotional response to something, and emotions do not last. They go up, they go down, and it, that is not what the Bible is speaking of in this regard. Okay, 13.3. As Paul continues with his words concerning self-denial without accompanied love, he notes that though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor is something that others may find notable. In Greek, the term bestow to feed the poor is one Greek word, so miso. It indicates to portion out or to give away by mouthfuls. The use of this word is to show that if someone were to take every scrap of their existence and parcel it out as a way of obtaining the favor of God or being elevated in the sight of men, it actually means nothing without love. In this, we can think of people who live as monks who own nothing and act piously. As they receive, they hand it out to others. On the surface, this may seem noble and worthy of commendation, but this is a worthless existence that ends in futility unless it is done in love. We saw that with great one right there. We read right before we started from Christian history, this guy was a monk and he didn't have any love at all for Christ. And what he was doing was absolutely futile. He could spend the rest of his life living in a monastery and doing good things for other people or not doing anything. And I don't think anybody would care. He's just a monk in a monastery. But unless you accompany it with love, it means doodly squat. If God isn't in their hearts and if there is no true sense of charity in their deeds, then they are simply wasting their lives. I'm going to mention that in our sermon on Sunday. If one is exalted through deeds of piety in the eyes of others... It means that they have received their reward in full. Paul goes on to say that though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. In the book of Daniel, the three children of Israel went to the flames rather than bow down to a false god. Others throughout history have done the same. 
Uh, I'm going to, I was just going to say John Huss, and I see his name is in my commentary. So I typed this three or four years ago, so I don't remember what I typed, but he's the first guy that came to mind. The burning of Christians in the early years of the faith was a common occurrence. Later, the Roman Catholic Church burned faithful believers at will. People such as John Huss gave themselves to the flames rather than bow to the church's wicked practices. These people gave their lives for the sake of Christ, standing on love for him rather than on love for this world. However, Paul shows that there is nothing intrinsically worthy in dying in this manner. Buddhist monks self-immolate from time to time in protests of certain events, don't they? They did it during the Vietnam War. They did it in Korea a couple weeks ago. They get out there and they think, I'm going to make a stand and I'm going to burn myself up. However, this, pointless, this is a pointless death unless it is done with true love as its purpose. One can die nobly for another, preserving the other's life in exchange for his own, or one can die for their faith in Christ and their properly directed love of God. In this, there is a valid reason for going to the flames. But to simply die for the sake of dying, consigning oneself to the flames without a loving reason in mind, has no merit at all. Life application, the greatest supposed acts of charity are completely worthless unless they are motivated by love. Without love, it's wasted effort. Bill Gates gives all kinds of money to charity, and he probably does it out of a guilty conscience because he's got a bunch of money, and he figures, I better do this, and so I'm going to, I don't think he does it out of love, and if he does it out of love, it's misdirected love because it's not love of God, right? But he does give a lot of money. 13.4. I'm not. Is he Jewish? You know? No, I don't think so. But you know, I, I don't want to second guess him. He may love what he's doing. I mean, he may have some real deep love in him for what he's doing, but it's not a properly directed love. He does not do it in the name of Jesus Christ, and it has no value. In the end, you might as well just not give anything. You're not going to get any rewards in heaven for it if you're not doing it in the name of Christ. Well, I went to a funeral, and because this guy was generous and all, but he is going to heaven. To, oh, yeah. The rabbi said. Hey, that, I've heard that, and I know somebody in this church, I won't say it without his permission, but he was at a funeral of somebody in his family, and another person stood up and said, he has earned his right to heaven. Mm -hmm. He did. He gave to the church, and he has earned his right to heaven. Imagine saying that. The family's deluded. Now that they know Christ, the one that I'm talking about, they look back and they think, how could that be? Unbelievable. All right. You don't earn your way to heaven, and you certainly don't earn it through giving away money or anything else. You earn it through faith in Christ, and that's it. It's not really earned at all. It's just simply accepting what he's done. Life application. I've already, well, I think I've read it. The greatest supposed acts of charity are completely worthless unless they are motivated by love. Without love, it is wasted effort. Okay, 13.4. We got 20 more minutes. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Keep thinking while I'm reading this because we're talking about Christian faith, love within the context of Christian faith, but it fits very well with the context of love between a husband and a wife. So keep thinking of that because it really is an important thing. Your marriage is like a picture of what Christ has done for the church. And so you want to keep thinking of these things. Anyway, um, where am I? 13.4. Starting in this verse, Paul will provide a host of the characteristics of love. Some will be passive, some will be active. Some will be positive, some will be negative. They will pro provide contrasts and they will provide parallel thoughts. By understanding love from these various angles, the perfections of love will be all the more evident. And those things which detract from love will be highlighted as well. He's providing this list for the benefit of those in Corinth and thus of us, particularly because several of these aspects have already been noted among the believers in the epistle. There has been jealousy, there's been infighting, there's been divisions and a puffed up attitude, which he has had to correct. Remember that, especially starting in chapter one and at times throughout until we've gotten to this chapter, he's noted these divisions and this infighting, this backbiting, all right? By defining, by defining true love, he will highlight what he does and doesn't expect meets the description of love, okay? He will highlight what does and doesn't meet this description. And so his list begins with love, suffers long, and is kind. Suffering is a passive action. 
Being kind is an active one. Suffering long is something that requires perseverance, while being kind requires continued attention. He next says that love does not envy. If someone achieves something great, those who exhibit love will not be jealous of their accomplishment, even if it is something that they themselves had strived for. Rather than envy, rejoicing will be demonstrated. I saw something last night. Uh, I won't tell you the name of it right now. Maybe I will, if I can think of it. Um, well, these people that climb mountains without any ropes, and I'm talking about the mountains. There's no place to grab, and they go all the way up. And um, there was one bad word in there, and so uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Free Solo. Free Solo is what it was called. And um, so I say there's a bad word. I wanted to say that in case somebody watches it and realizes, hey, that's got a bad word in it. Charlie recommended that. I'm telling you in advance. Um, uh, these people, you know, they climb up the most difficult mountains on the planet, okay? And they go up with ropes and they put in these things. And the first time anybody ever went up El Capitan in California, it took them 46 days to get up there. And they had to do it in parts, okay? This is how difficult that is. I've driven by it and I can tell you, it is the biggest piece of concrete on this planet, all right? And there are places where you have to go up and have to go back down. You have to go up. And there is one place where you put your finger here and then you put this finger here and then you move your hand. And it, literally, there's this much space where they can get where it's not slippery. There's just a little indentation. And they've got this figured out where these people climb and they all know they have to put one finger here and then put the other finger here so they can move there. And it, all the way up, it's like this, okay? So these people are climbing up there with ropes. But there are people that are called free climbers and they go to places that have been climbed with ropes and they climb without any ropes. And a lot of them die. They usually end up dead because it becomes an obsession and eventually they make a mistake and down they go. But nobody has ever climbed El Capitan free. It would be considered almost impossible. And yet somebody decided he was going to do it and they follow him. It's NPR, I think, that or uh, uh, National Geographic. They follow him. And they've got cameras that are huge. They can see him from the ground all the way up like he's a teeny little dot. And then they can zoom in on him. They've got cameras here and there. And there are people that have he had idolized over the years. You know, this is my hero. I want to be like him, these mountain climbers. And now these people are down on the ground rejoicing at what he is doing, attempting this and afraid for him. That's the point that I'm making is that that what's, is what Paul is saying. There may be some, somebody that actually excels you in the ministry. They may excel you in what you do. And love means that you'll rejoice for them, not be jealous of them, not try to hinder them from excelling because everybody has got a gift. And if somebody has been given a gift by God that will excel yours, then you should rejoice for them. Okay. I'll give you, okay. I'm not going to tell you what happened on it, but if you want to watch it, it is, it is astonishing. Okay. My hair standing up, just thinking about it, it was really, it was astonishing. Okay. So um, here's a perfect example from within the ministry. I have uh, YouTube's uh, videos that we've put on YouTube for the Superior Word. Actually, I say I, but I've uploaded a lot of them, but I didn't start doing it and I didn't know how to until I was told to. But I think it was three weeks ago, we had 1,003 videos done from the Superior Word. And by now we're probably up to maybe 1,012 or something. Okay. And the number of subscribers, which I normally wouldn't know, but he told me today, it's not a lot. It might be, we'll say it's uh, 13,000, I think is what you said. Okay. So I've got a thousand videos and we got 13,000 subscribers. Okay. How many views? I don't know. Total, it might be a million. Okay. I, you know, whatever. We'll just say a million for all the views. And then comes along somebody that started doing videos from the superior word. The Superior Word Church was where they were doing their videos from. Who am I speaking about? Sergio. Sergio. Okay. They put out, I think they have 30 or 40 videos and they have 50,000 plus subscribers and they have millions of views with just 50 or 60 videos. Now I could be jealous of that, but I'm actually like a father towards his son. I'm rejoicing over it, that the Lord has blessed him and they have turned this into a real ministry because people have come to the Lord through this. People have that rededicated their life through it and they don't make it ostentatious. They don't, not, you know, if you've seen them, they don't, they don't actively evangelize anybody, but they have a simple witness for the Lord. They bring him in at, from time to time, just on the side. And yet 
it, it is wonderful to see how they prosper. Now I could be jealous of that and say, look, gee whiz, you know, that's a bummer. I do all this hard work and I got a thousand videos and there's nothing to show for it. But there is, I'm not, I'm just saying that. I'm not trying to complain in any way. And I could compare myself to him and instead, I'm just rejoicing in what's happened with him. It's marvelous. People come to the Lord. You know, when I was in Israel, Rhoda was with her parents and they were shopping while we were walking from Jericho to Jerusalem. And somebody came up who recognized Rhoda in the market, wanted her autograph, wanted to have lunch with them and everything. So, I mean, it's wonderful. It's like seeing your kids grow up and being blessed. That's what Paul is speaking about here. I didn't mean to divert so much, but it's important to understand when somebody is down at the base of a mountain watching somebody that used to watch him and he's rejoicing for him that shows a true love and appreciation for that person's skill not a jealous whatever okay let's see here so uh where was i um he's providing this list for the benefit of those in oh i've read that okay he begins his list i'm going to start again love suffers long and is kind suffering is passive being kind is active suffering long is something that requires perseverance while being kind requires continued attention he next says that love does not envy. This is where I left off. If someone achieves something great, those who exhibit love will not be jealous of their accomplishment, even if it is something that they themselves had strived for. Rather than envy, rejoicing will be demonstrated. Paul next says that love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Parading is showing off. If one truly loves, there's no need to put that love into a spotlight of life. Rather, the very nature of love is evident without ostentation. Being puffed up indicates pride and boasting. If we do something for another person in a true spirit of love, there's no need to sound out the deed for others to see. There will also be no desire to hold that deed over the person, reminding them of what was accomplished for them. Rather, the deed is rendered and it is not brought up again by the doer. Boy, if we can learn that one, because how often do we want to say, well, you know, remember back in 1917, I, I did this for you and you just keep bringing it up, bringing it up. It yeah. <laughs> life application, a life which is truly loving will demonstrate that state in a volitional manner. Even when tensions exist, they will continue to willingly place the perfections of love before those things which would be a hindrance to them. Occasionally coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and contemplating its words is a good way to always keep these precepts at the forefront of one's mind. And you don't have to just come to 1 Corinthians 13 from time to time and read it. Guess what? If you read your Bible 30 minutes a day, you're going to be there at least two or three times a year anyway. So read your Bible. You'll get to here and you'll be reminded of this. You don't have to just say, gee, what was it in 1 Corinthians 13? I better go find my Bible and Dust it off and go see what it says. Just keep reading the Bible. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Keep reading it. Life application. I've already said that. 13.5. Let's see here. Does not behave rudely. Speaking of love still. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek his own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Four more traits of the nature of love are given from the pen of Paul in this verse. The first is that it does not behave rudely. If someone is truly loving toward another, there will be no improper conduct towards that person. There will be due respect for the individual regardless of societal class. There will be an attitude of care regardless of nationality. The amount of money or type of home the person has won't be considered in how that person is treated. There will always be a tone of decency and propriety in one's conduct towards others. If these things are lacking, then the true heart of love is also lacking. Now, I can say this, that different cultures do things towards one another differently. And some things that we might think are actually unloving towards another person are the norm there. So you got to know what the culture is teaching before you go getting down on somebody. I've seen that firsthand. But, uh, you know, one of the things I never got, this has nothing to do with love, but it's an example which follows, okay, is we would, well, we might think of this as loving, being prompt, being on time. When you ask somebody to go out for dinner and they don't show up on time, you think that's not respectful of us. So we could use that as uh, an example. When I lived in Malaysia, I'm not exaggerating when I say this. We were invited to uh, our 
landlord's house. I, maybe we invited them first, but I think they invited us first. I don't remember. One way or another, it went both ways. They will say they invited us first. And so what time should we come? They said, be there at six o'clock. Okay. And we showed up at six o'clock. And they said, what are you doing here? <laughs> we said, we're, you invite us to be here for dinner. Well, yeah, but dinner's not ready. And we sat around, we waited until 9.30 before she had even started cooking, right? And so we thought, well, maybe we just misunderstood what they had said, but we invited them to come over for dinner. And I'm not kidding. You can ask you to go if you don't believe this. We invited them over. What time do you want? Well, we like to eat early. So we said, come at five. <laughs> they never came. And so we went to bed at 9.30 and at 10 o'clock, they knock on the door. And we said, what are you doing here? We're in our pajamas. What are you doing here? Well, you said to come for dinner. Yeah, we said five o'clock. We've eaten, we've gone to bed. But that was the way they did it. And it took, us a, it took us a long time just to understand that, but we never got used to it. But this happened again and again and again in Malaysia. There's no such t thing as true time there, but I don't know how you determine what the real time is. You told me this about the church in the Dominican Republic yes. when you went there. Yeah. Church starts at nine. She shows up at nine and she's the only person there. They come at 11 or 11.30 and she said, where have you been? Oh, well, we're here for church. But you said nine. Yeah, but we're here for church. So there are people that, and to us, that would be unloving. So you got to be careful when you take these things to apply them to your own culture. Okay. I'll tell you another thing about Malaysia. This would really seem unloving here is we invited over our dentist. Her name was Padma. Wonderful lady. She used to spend like 40 minutes on this one silver tooth. She loved to play with it and make it as shiny as she could. Anyway, she'd do the whole mouth in five minutes, but that tooth would be, she just, ooh, I want to make it perfect. Anyway, Padma, we invited her over for dinner. Okay. She comes over and she has her whole family oh. with her. And that's what they do there. They just, if you get invited, you're inviting the family. And you don't know if you're cooking for three people or for 23 people. You have no idea. And so we were totally unprepared for that one. But once again, you got to, when you think of love in this respect, think of it from the cultural perspective of the people, because their cultures will drive their thoughts that we might think are unloving. So be careful with that. That's just an example. I don't want to get too far off on that, but it's kind of interesting how the rest of the world works. I know America works properly. The rest of the world, I don't know. Anyway, um, let's right. see here. Yes. They eat at 10. What time do they go to bed? I have no idea. I, I never they figured it out. I never. Oh, listen, those Chinese get up early. They are the hardest working people on this planet are the Chinese. And that's everywhere I've been, wherever I've been. And there has been a community of Chinese. If you need your car fixed, go there. They work very cheaply and they work very properly. I've never seen anything like it. Okay, Chinese are really, really hardworking folks, but they get up early. And I don't know what time they went to bed, but they would be up early and they'd be out working. So they're so. the Malaysians, the Chinese? No, no, no. Malay is a multicultural society. You've got the Malaysians, and then you've got, uh, I think it's like 30% are Chinese that moved into the land, and they own everything, but they're a minority. So that caused a lot of problems in the 60s. And May uh, 5th, I think it was 1969, there were actually very great wars between them, and a lot of people died, and they finally came to a settling but the chinese own most of it but they're the minority and then there's six percent indians there and that's because malaya was colonized by the british and when the british they wanted people to move down there to take care of the land they took their own servants when they moved from india because they had their servants for years and years even generations and they said come with us and we'll have a new land so there was a big population of hindus there too but it's malay or the indigenous people they call themselves the bumi putra the people of the earth and then everybody else are people that moved in and whatever. Anyway, we better go on. We got just, we better stop. We're going to do 13.5 again next week because we're, we're running out of time. And because we started early, I don't want Mike to have a problem with the video. We can't go over an hour and a half without there being a problem. So I'm going to mark 13.5 as for next week. And uh, sorry, I didn't mean, you asked the question though. So it took me probably longer than we're going to have to finish this. So that's okay. I don't feel too bad, but anyway, interesting stuff, but be careful about the loving part in other cultures because it really can be difficult to know what that is. But uh, in this culture or whatever culture you're in, you're going to have the right attitude if you're going to be a loving person. Okay. Let's uh, say a prayer. We will be done. Heavenly father. Thank you so much for Paul's words. They really are an inspiration. It's so beautiful to come to this passage and to uh, see the gifts that we've been given and how we can use them to your glory and then to 
move right into this passage on love and what a marvelous passage it is that it can inspire our soul every time we read it, even if we read it every day of our lives. Thank you for your word, which is so precious. And thank you above all for Christ Jesus, our Lord, who went to the cross of Calvary so that we could be saved through his precious blood. And we have a sure hope of that because of the knowledge we possess from your word. And so we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, back this thing up here. It's your signature. What's that? It's your signature.